I'm Wesley Eplin. I serve as the Director of Health Equity at Health and Medicine Policy Research Group. My preferred gender pronouns are he, his, and him. For those of you who don't know Health and Medicine Policy Research Group, the organization was founded in 1981 by Dr. Quentin Young, a fierce health and social justice advocate. Health and Medicine is a nonprofit independent policy research center focused on advancing health equity and access to affordable, high quality health care for all Illinoisans. Today's forum is part of two series of forums. It is part of Health and Medicine's long-running Chicago Forum for Justice and Health Policy, our series on health reform, health equity, and advancing the health of the public through policy reform. This forum is also the seventh and final forum in a series hosted and organized by members of the Chicago Housing Justice League, a group of more than three dozen organizations of which Health and Medicine is a member. These forums raise up the principles and recommendations we've developed as a group for Chicago's next five-year housing plan, a copy of which is in your uh, packets. I have a few notes of appreciation. The Chicago Housing Justice League has been brought together and organized by the Lawyers Committee for Better Housing, who I'd like to thank for their co-sponsorship of today's forum. Our appreciation goes to the Lawyers Committee for Better Housing and to Frank Avalon especially for helping make today's forum possible. Thank you. I also want to express our gratitude to the Chicago Community Trust for their support of the series and of our organization's work. Next, I want to appreciate members of Health and Medicine staff for their teamwork to make today's forum possible. There are several of us in the room. Um, thanks to Karen Moda and Morgan Higgins for your efforts to, to bring all this together. And I especially want to thank Juliana Lopez, for recently, who recently joined Health and Medicine as a policy research analyst. Juliana has done an amazing job leading the development of today's forum, handling the details of both the content and um, all the logistics to bring us all together today. Um, our executive director, Margie Shapps, is here with us today, as are a few board members. Um, can we have a round of applause for all of our partners? Um, now I want to spend a few moments get, setting the stage for today's forum. We are here to discuss the juncture of health equity and housing justice. If you work in public health or in healthcare, you're likely already aware of the importance of housing, a fundamental human need and human right to people's health. We hope to deepen that understanding today and to make all of us more effective advocates for housing justice. We have to ask fundamental questions like, is our housing safe, healthy, affordable, and accessible? And for whom? With the increased focus on population health within the healthcare sector, there has been increased attention to trying to fill in gaps within the social de determinants of health, such as housing. This has brought about opportunity for new partnerships for those working in healthcare, in public health, and in other sectors, such as housing. Laudable as these efforts are, helping a few dozen patients here or there is very helpful, but it's an insufficient response to a systemic crisis of unaffordable housing that as many of us discussed at our forum last December, contributes to the displacement of many thousands of Chicagoans and leaves so many people unable to afford their bills. This is a structural inequity requiring policy solutions. Today's forum will push us all, all to dig deeper, to take our commitment to housing justice a step further and focus on structural determinants of health inequities, the policies, the systems, and governance that drive housing and health inequities. We must also recognize the ways in which both racism and class inequity play out in housing. Who is being displaced and for whom and by whom? Which communities remain most impacted by lead poisoning in Chicago? Who was most impacted by the foreclosure crisis? And what are we willing to do to rectify these and other inequities? Just as we might try to influence Medicaid policy or defend the Affordable Care Act against repeal, those who care about health equity will need to step up and join the communities and housing advocates who have long fought for housing policy. Chicago's five-year housing plan is just one venue to influence positive change on the housing policy front. Now, before I introduce our first speaker, I will take a uh, moment just to review the agenda with you all. Um, I should note before I do that that we invited someone from the Department of Planning and Development from the city uh, to join us, but they were unavailable to join today. Um, so first, we'll hear about the five-year housing plan from the executive director of the Chicago Rehab Network, Kevin Jackson. Uh, we'll have time for Q&A with Kevin after his presentation. Afterward, we'll take a moment to work in pairs on question number one on your worksheet in your packet. That's the yellow sheet. 
Um, the purpose of the worksheet is to help us all process the discussion today, to help capture our thoughts and ideas. It's also a time for us to uh, connect with one another uh, as one of our outcomes of these forums is for us to become a stronger community of practice. So I hope that you all will exchange contact information and connect offline um, beyond today's forum. We will then learn about the Chicago Housing Justice League from Frank Avalone of the Lawyers Committee for Better Housing, our principles, and the policy ideas we're putting forward. Frank will then introduce and moderate a panel discussion. We'll have time for Q&A with, with them as well. Um, we will then have time to again process the discussion with our neighbors, collecting our thoughts and reporting out before we close. Um, information regarding both Wi-Fi access and restrooms can be found on your agenda. If you have questions or concerns, please see me or another member of Health and Medicine staff. Um, now it is, is my pleasure to introduce Kevin Jackson, the Executive Director of the Chicago Rehab Network, which is a citywide coalition of neighborhood and community-based development organizations made up of 40 organizations spanning 60 city neighborhoods. I understand Kevin has been involved with several Chicago five-year housing plans and has a wealth of knowledge to share. So. Please, uh, kind of round of applause for Kevin. Thank you, Rosie. Thank you, Rosie. Good morning. Good morning. Nice to see everyone. Happy summer. <laughs> uh, as Wesley mentioned, I'm Kevin Jackson with the Chicago Rehab Network. It's a coalition of community development corporations. That's a real important kind of framing of what we're about. At the Rehab Network, we don't touch real estate. Our members do. There's uh, members such as Hispanic Housing and Bickerdike that have over thousands of units of uh, affordable rental multifamily housing. Uh, we have the Resurrection Project over in Pilsen that has some single family. So we really look across the whole spectrum. The common denominator is how do you make sure we have affordable housing. For Chicago, we work across a lot of uh, institutions and partners. As Wesley mentioned, one of the key things that happened in 1993 was the first affordable housing plan. It was a campaign that happened uh, in the da second Daly's first administration. So I've been asked to kind of give you that context of what's going on. We're presently getting ready to create the sixth five-year plan. So we're going into... we're completing 25 years of these plans, one of the salient points that I want to point out is, historically, it's kind of been focused on, well, what are the resources we can derive? What do we anticipate? And what units are we thinking in terms of development? And that unit count is whether it's going to be a family housing, whether it's going to be, and what income level. And what we're looking at today is to try to flip that a bit with our colleagues here and ask, Wait a minute, we have an incredible deficit of affordable housing in Chicago. The Institute of Housing Justice pegs the number at about 120,000 units shortfall. So we want to ask ourselves, how do we get to that? Because that's what Chicago needs. And people, I don't need to tell you what's happening in the city and how fast it's changing in many places. But at the same time, one of the great challenges is trying to make sure we have, as Wesley mentioned, kind of a racial equity framework in thinking about this because frequently we think about affordable housing in the context of gentrification and the notion that people are losing their housing because of the rapidly escalating real estate values. Equally great, if not greater, of a problem is the depopulation that's happening in the south and west sides. So I'm just going to go through some of these slides. I think they'll be helpful. Um, we just appreciate this opportunity. Are we up? Okay, so on this one, we are in the last years of bouncing back plan. That's the current five-year plan. And th this shows the projections. Um, what slide am I on? I, gotta, I didn't do this presentation before my colleague did. So you guys are getting the first round through. Did, did I already pass the first one? No, okay. There, no. I got it. I see what we're doing here. All right. So this, you can see, these are the commitments that they're expecting. On the left is the multifamily and the single family. What we recognize is the city's going to actually meet its goals or be very close, exceed a little bit in terms of the units they anticipated over five years, as well as the incomes. Here's a chart that's very helpful to put the context of the five-year plans. 
Their very first one in 1993 had a commitment of just a uh, budget commitment, we're talking about, of a billion, what is the number there? One billion. And you can see each five years it continues to increase until the last one at 2014 to 2018, we see a precipitous drop off. And that is in part because we're talking about the entire budgeted funds the city is going to use. The lion's share is federal funds. And so we had HERA, the Housing Economic Recovery Act, in uh, George Bush's the, uh, administration that had programs like NSP, the city of Chicago, that's Neighborhood Stabilization Program, received $155 million. So you had a lot of those programs weren't renewed once we started to come out of the recession. But there were others that we, we see were lost, and it's still a, a, a concern. You may have heard Mayor Emanuel just ask that uh, we should create a Department of Housing. Well, that's not new for us, right? You can see on the chart that all the way to the left is when the last time we had a Department of Housing in 2008. So 10 years later, we're looking at let's do it again. The Rehab Network's uh, point of presentation was beginning of August 1st is a quarterly hearing. This is the salient point I want to keep on people's mind is since 1993, the Department of Housing or Planning is the only department that had to go in front of the Committee of Housing and Real Estate and make a public presentation on its progress every quarter of meeting its goals. And the Rehab Network has been there doing an analysis and discussing with the Alderman how the city is doing on its housing point. But the point here is to notice in, in 2008, all the way to the left, you had four departments dedicated to real estate and development. Department of Housing on the left, Department of Planning, Department of Zoning, and the Mayor's Office of Workforce Development. What you see the high graph on the left is, is how much money was being committed. In the Department of Housing alone, on the left, you see it was over $32 million. Then you can go through all the renditions. Uh, you can get these from checking with us, Call me, whatever you want. Different, you, know, you go to the Department of Community Development, then it went to the Department of Housing and Economic Development, then it went to the Department of Planning and Development. The point is, at the end, as of last year, we are not even close to what we were spending 10 years ago. I was speaking with a businessman last week, and he goes, well, no wonder why we're in such shit place. That's his line, not mine. All right, so the first quarter, 2018 housing activities, this is just comes from the report that we present to the city. I'm not going to go through it. Uh, first quarters are generally low volume quarters. The city maximizes its development practices in the third and fourth quarter historically. The one thing that you do see is the bottom bullet says 2,500 households were supported and those are very low and extremely low income households through the Chicago Low Income Housing Trust Fund. All right, and this goes through the trust fund, single family homes. I'm gonna move through this rather quickly because I wanna have time for your questions. And I know there's a big panel, a lot of activities. It's, it's a very full agenda. This just shows what they did in single family homes per year uh, on a graph. The single family home production of the city is something a lot of advocates are calling for a much more ramped up program as it's not been very uh, robust in the last five, 10 years. And we'll see if they're going to, they're talking about reintroducing what was called uh, the Chicago homes. Here you see the rental home produced by AMI. That's the, uh, between the last 2014 to 2017, so for the past four years, the uh, largest amount is that household incomes between roughly historically is like 50 to 60 percent is where we're seeing that. The AMI for the city of Chicago in 2010 was approximately 48,000 for a family. And now I think it's still, it's dropped a little bit as of 2015. That's another feature of the Rehab Network. We do a fact book looking at every community area and every ward and that charts the demographics and housing 
changes that happen between the census states. This is the housing dollar commitments. You can see that. Again, this was just looking at the annual goal for the first quarter. This is, was what we presented to the alderman. I'm going to move through this. Here's the ARO and density bonus. So what they're talking about on site is 438 units have been created since 2003. The ARO has created 100, has leveraged $147 million. Do people understand what that is? The Affordable Requirements Ordinance is something that occurred because of an incredible effort. So you had in 1993, a huge effort. The city didn't say, oh, we want to do this five-year plan. Thank you very much. It was like a year, 280 organizations joined in the campaign, calling for the plan. Fast forward in 2003, we're seeing this wave of the first gentrification that people were concerned with, right? In 2005, the language that I would tell folks is, in every neighborhood, the context was, the train's leaving the station. If you don't buy a home now, you'll never get in. Right? And so advocates across the city work to try to get a plan for inclusionary housing. That's it. Whenever the, there's going to be 10, develop, 10 units being developed or more, we're going to ask that you do an affordable unit, a percentage piece on that. It took about six years to get this to be passed. And it was passed in different formats. I'm not going to go through all the details in the weeds. But imagine that 10 years later, it's generated $147 million. In the third quarter, so this is all the real estate you see being developed in the loop. So if you don't build on site, you have to pay in lieu of fee. It was very modest. It was $100,000. It was amended in 2015 to go up to 175,000. Imagine in 2017, I believe it's in the second quarter, third quarter, we can get the facts. One quarter alone generated $10 million. Because the developers are saying, I'm not gonna go. It's much cheaper to do the in lieu of fee. Because the cost of development exceeds 300,000, your choice, but it's the way it is. It's still, it's, it exceeds what we're getting from the federal government. I'll hold aside the tax credit. So it's just one tool, much more needs to go on. Then what we have introduced with colleagues across the city is in this planning process, as you see, is five strategies toward housing stability for all Chicagoans. And so we've been presenting this to the city and around the city uh, one that is so critical for today's climate is to have very strong anti-displacement strategies. And what we're trying to think about is both in those areas where people are being moved out. Anyone see last week Crane's report at Humboldt Park, what the real estate values increase was? Yeah. What was it? 45%. It's just very hard for people to keep up with that. So anti-displacement strategies are looking at one of the key ones is we try to think about different housing structures. We think about uh, low equity co-ops, mutual housing kind of things. We also think that it makes sense to think about how we can deal with the property tax issues. There's an incredible amount of challenge for households as taxes reach up, and we'd like to think about creating some zones. And we're not gonna go through everything that we need, but it's really an important framework is, Austin has the city a benchmark of what they're saying we wanna reduce displacement. It's just becoming more and more in the recognition that, you know, it's just too costly to lose affordable housing. Once it's gone, we can't get back. So we've always been long advocates for preservation. A second strategy is to support and expand rental housing. That's affordable. The city has a real estate transfer tax, as does the state. The state puts almost all of its transfer tax into housing development, affordable <coughs> housing development. The city puts zero toward that. 
So these are some of the things that we're looking for is trying to prioritize housing because as you're here to discuss and what we've long known is the effects of health and housing are so intertwined. It was in 2001 we had a conference called Valuing Affordability and what an emergency nurse room, uh, emergency room nurse came into this forum of hundreds of people and described to people then the injustice of people having to make these incredible choices about their health or their housing cost. So we have other ways that we're thinking about the uh, expanding the requirements for affordable housing. Oops, jump too fast. We want to see in this plan, we've mentioned the low income housing trust fund and uh, what we're hoping for is it's a very solid program. We'd like to see it tripled. So we see three times more of the households being served. Uh, again, single family, home uh, innovation. What we're hoping to see there is more people being able to get into a rental opportunity in home ownership. And lastly, we believe there should be an impact analysis created so that people understand what will happen if this development goes on. Uh, We've called for this in the past. That's what you'll find in the world of all of our advocacy across health, housing, education. It takes years for things to finally get recognized. That's a pretty smart idea. But the ex classic example is the 606 trail. And people are like, oh, shoot. I didn't know everybody would have to leave now that we did this. <laughs> and you can imagine the other ones that are coming up. So that's the overview of where we're at. And uh, thanks so much for, I'll take any questions or comments. Yes. Kevin, uh, this is just an informational question. Not so long ago, your organization published really incredibly useful data on right. community races about demographics right. and change over time and housing prices and so forth. Thanks, sir. Uh, please do it again. <laughs> we, we, we would love to do it again. We are in the process of updating because the last one was 2000 to 2010, we do the decennial census. That's what it's based on. And then we break it down. It's the only framework that we know of that looks at, well, what happened in Logan Square? Or what happened in Greater Grand Crossing of the 77? Uh, so we've done that since 1990. So meaning we have the data from 80, 1980. All those years, it's been a real helpful tool and as all these things do, there's a lot of competition today about uh, the funding and support for these type of activities. Thank God we have the Pope Brothers, the Chicago Community Trust has been uh, remain strong supporters. But there's been a lot of change in the funding environment and housing, as most of you will know. Any other comments? Um, you mentioned in lieu fees, and that's yes. one of the things that actually we're trying to move out simply because, I mean, it's one of these things where I think, would you say it looks like it's just a way to shift priorities financially because that money goes what, to the land trust now, right? Half of it goes to the Chicago Low Income Housing Trust Fund, uh -huh. and the other half is used for development in other communities across the city. Okay, yeah, so, I mean, so I think our ultimate goal is to get rid of them with fees altogether, correct? That's, uh, I, I'm certainly very alert and aware and understand that. Um, I don't think it's the ultimate goal simply, and it's controversial. I don't think it's the ultimate goal because we believe that development should be equitable, it should be happening in all communities. That is a uh, engine that we can use to develop in Lawndale where you're not going to see necessarily the type of development that's happening in Lakeview. But because of that framework alone, we don't think that we should not have opportunities in other neighborhoods. So some balance is what we've looked for and hope to see. But I certainly understand in uptown situation, it's an alarm to see money not made more available to help people remain in uptown and other communities. I'm in Logan Square, which has its own set of problems, actually. Absolutely. Yeah. No doubt. 
Hi, Kathy Powers from the Community Mental Health Board. What is your view about rent control? Uh, well, first view is we do have rent control insofar as the largest production of affordable housing is done through the programs that require income verification and income levels. So the Low Income Housing Trust Fund, the Low Income Housing Tax Credit, these are all programs that require a rent limitation. Your broader question is the broader market itself, should there be rent controls? Um, we certainly support getting rid of the state law that says localities can't have this discussion. Yes. Absolutely. That's a, 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 a terrible situation that occurred. Uh, and then how that plays out, I, I think that it's a difficult situation for me sometimes to speak across these issues because the variation of organizations involved with the Chicago Rehab Network are generated from all neighborhoods. And in different neighborhoods, there's different understandings and perspectives that people want to see. I think that, in general, we've we're been very supportive of COCO, the Hamlet Oakland Community Organization, and others that have been leading this call. And there's uh, uh, certainly an issue that it should be at least tested and applied to see what it can do. I think uh, Frank has made some very strong comments about some of the research he's done, suggesting that it's a very stabilizing policy. And that's what we want to see, is stability in people's lives. And housing insecurity is one of the most disruptive things that happen to people. So if rent control can bring stability, we're all for it. Yes, sir. Uh, Jim Bloyd, Cook County Department of Public Health. I'm wondering what, uh, in your opinion, is the role played by the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for planning in affecting I'd like them to use the word affordable on one of their plans. It would be just a breath of fresh air to say, oh, we need it. To me, to cut straight to the chase, that's one of the strongest indications of why there's such uh, racial injustice in housing is because people want to clothe it as though it's a, 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 a mask about race. And on the one hand, you know what? Damn straight. The city's housing policies have been generated for generations on a, a racial angle that's been very disruptive and unfair and unjust to people of color, particularly the African American community. So, one of the ways to get at this, and I've argued with my dear friend Ori Pennick for years when she was at Leadership Council for Open Metropolitan Communities, is fair housing requires affordability. And we need affordable housing in every community. And it remains. The irony about this is how difficult it gets for people to understand affordable housing is they say, well, where do we need affordable housing? And you guys can answer that. Where's the greatest need for affordable housing? Name me a community. Lincoln Park, good answer. Who else has got a name? Oh, what's that? Hyde Park. Uptown. Where is it? Everywhere. I didn't hear. Garfield Park. Garfield Park. So the Institute for Housing Studies looks at what's the gap? It's called the affordable gap. And that means what's the need? How many people, this is what Sarah was talking about, our, our, our studies, how many people need affordable housing? What do we talk about when we say affordable housing real quick? What people should not spend more than 30% of their income. Any expense greater than 30% is called carpal cost burden. That's what the community of housing policy works with. Once people spend more than 30%, they start to have challenges in their household budgets. Imagine that if you're extremely cost burdened, spending more than 50%. And in Cook County, there's over 100 
thousand households that are extremely cost burdened. I do think CMAP has a, a, a very strong framework that's important. I didn't want to be dismissive. But I think that we've let housing get distilled to this notion of it's got to follow the market. The market is, we don't want to mess with the market. Right? And, and that's why we've gotten in ourselves because we haven't been honest about that. The affordable gap, the greatest gap, isn't in Lincoln Park. It's in Washington Park, Jackson Park, and Woodlawn. That region has the greatest gap in all of Cook County, meaning the number of households that want and need an affordable place have the greatest distance of gap shortage. And that's what happened. What's that mean? Well, their incomes are lower. And now what's happening there? People are leaving. The, that's what the great, you know, what we're, what we're faced with in the city of Chicago. Uh, our friend um, at the Metropolitan Planning Council, now he's at uh, the, what, what did he BZ. Um, said, you know, we had the great migration that built the city and helped contribute to the city, and now we had this incredible black flight. Because from 2000 to 2010, the first time we looked at that, we saw 200,000 people leave the city. Over 90% were African American. That trend continues. And what the new, potentially new assessors said uh, last week in a forum is he thinks it's largely driven, in no small part, from property tax and that type of issue. Other comments, questions? Yes, please. There were recently some articles published about how uh, some aldermen choose to push against these affordable housing policies because their constituents are content with the segregation in the city. So what do you think could be done to incentivize aldermen to push for these affordable housing policies? That's a great question. Um, it's a really good question. I think you're going to get more in that in the panel uh, discussion. I think that <coughs> our experience suggests it's too important of an issue to be held ex exclusively at the hands of an alderman yeah. in, in a neighborhood. Um, you know, we don't get to say, uh, are you going to have a public school? Well, I guess, I guess maybe that question is not the way <laughs> it works anymore. <laughs> Just like health clinics, right? we don't get to say. But no, seriously, when, when I think about it, I love the image, and this is maybe what a, a planning association can be about, is when we did, started the Northwest Ordinance that created this area that we live in today, right, in the, whatever it was, the late 1700s, you know, every township was and every, there's, there's a requirement based on the number of people that you had to go to public school. And I think that type of thinking about saying, look, I've got to really think about who, where's the workforce going to live? Right? Where are people going to be? When we passed the ARO, it was Tom Tunney, alderman up by Wrigley Field, said, for crying out loud, my workforce is outside of the city. It's not fair for people who are working food staff positions have to come from Dalton and every place else. The transportation costs. So, you know, the facts are we've known this. We have people say, well, we just got to convince people. If only they knew. No, oh, come on, we know. It's what built the middle class in many people's minds. Is if you could get an affordable place that allowed you to create some equity and have a uh, resource in your household that you could borrow from to send your kids to school. Now as the changing America is up front uh, and, and, and up on us, it's like, yeah, that's not so good anymore. I don't think that works. It's too much, right? So I think to your question, it is a issue that needs addressed in ways beyond just a elected officials' boards, and there's people that are looking at that. And I do understand that there is the tension there, 
is that we do want people to have discussions of land use policy from a local perspective. So it's a constant engagement and it's our efforts and people that are here today, I see many of them that I've seen on the front lines of doing this. I am always honored by people who work so hard in neighborhoods to think about how can we make places for everyone. And it takes people being getting up in the morning and going to bed at night asking the question. So thanks for all of you that I see here that do that all the time. Thank you. First of all, the presentation from Frank Avalon from the Awareness Committee uh, for Better Housing, but um, he'll speak for a few. We we'll have another presentation and a panel discussion. We'll do it until the end just to catch up on time a little bit. Um, when you, uh, when we do connect, please announce who you are, your share, share your name, your organization. Um, the, uh, what else do I want to share? Oh, you may have seen a crowd come in. That was, uh, we have a DePaul public health class with us today. So we have a round of applause for for <laughs> uh, So next, uh, I'd like to introduce Frank Babylon, Senior Attorney and Policy Coordinator for the Lawyers Committee for Better Housing. who will review with us the principles and recommendations of the league before introducing the spring panel. So um, the Housing Justice League started with a brainstorm last November when uh, 39 people were sitting in a room at Lawyers Committee for Better Housing upstairs talking about just cause for eviction. And we started talking about whether or not trying to be involved with the city's five-year, what used to be called affordable housing plan, um, would be uh, worth our while. And many people who had been engaged in that process in the past, their countenance fell and they shook their heads. Um, I mean, the thought was is that um, it was a waste of effort. The amount of resources that get put in, the kind of things that get promoted um, favor certain people over other people. And really, from our perspective, it wasn't a productive enterprise. But then we started thinking, well, wait a minute. The times have changed, have they? Have they? That was the question. Have things sufficiently changed in the last 10 years, not only locally, but nationwide, and particularly in the last five years? Have things changed enough where the people's movement and the environmental movement and the uh, other movements that are based in people-centered policies, have they grown enough and have enough momentum that maybe this is worth the effort this time? And certainly the Bernie Sanders candidacy made it more popular to talk about things in the open, because since 1980, some of you in this audience will recall, something happened in 1980, a guy named Ronald Reagan got elected. and. Um, the whole discussion at our national level became shifted and focused away from where it had been for 100 years before that. The Democratic Party became the party of the establishment. Yeah. Um, so we looked at each other and said, is it time that maybe we can have an impact? Is it time that maybe uh, this might be worthwhile? We were informed by a lot of things because we answered that question, yes, that even if we can't get the city to adopt the policies and programs that are people-centered rather than profit-centered, even if we can't do that, the discourse in the public and amongst decision-makers is worth the effort, yeah. particularly because it's uh, an election year. I don't say that cynically. In our democracy, unlike some others, we only ask people to step up once every four years. Yeah? When actually we should be deeply embedded in the decision making around our neighborhoods and our society on a daily level. So we were informed by a number of things that there are 627,000 rental units in the city of Chicago, consisting of over 60% of all the dwelling units and over half the population, yeah? That's nearly, it's over one and a half million people. Um, we were informed that 80,000 of those rental units were deeply affected by the foreclosure crisis and continue to be. Of course, to the national news media, the foreclosure crisis is 
over, but not for renters, it's not. Um, about that since 1970 through today, we're still in the city of Chicago cranking out 25 to 35,000 eviction cases every single year. Yeah. We estimate, and we have to estimate because the system doesn't keep track of what it does, we estimate that 25 to 30 percent of those evictions are without cause, without fault. The tenant's done nothing wrong. So, the tool of the discriminator, the retaliator, the gentrifier, the flipper, regardless of what you may think about an individual situation, is to simply come into a neighborhood, buy buildings, and pass out 30-day notices, followed by the filing of an eviction case. Eviction cases from start to finish. Finish meaning that the sheriff comes out to your house, the gendarme with the holstered gun, and locks you out. That entire process, start to finish, can take as little as a month, takes as much as three months, but the lion's share of cases take about one to two months. All right. So we were informed by these different things, as Kevin mentioned, the gap in affordable housing units, about 118,000, according to the DePaul Housing Institute, but there's about 200,000 people on the Section 8 waiting list. So what's the real number? I mean, I don't know, but if you look at the rough math, some have estimated that the gap in affordable housing is a $26 billion problem. $26 billion, I can't wrap my head around that. But you saw from Kevin's data that the city is spending about $1.4 billion in a five-year cycle. Yeah. So we're, we're dropping pennies against the dollar of a larger program. Um, okay. So. Why is this important to begin with? Of course, it's, it, it's intuitive. Housing is a basic human need. We all know that, yeah, but it's so much more than that, isn't it? At the personal level, housing becomes the springboard from which all other meaningful life activities take place. Family, friends, school, church, your sense of place, your sense of anchor, your sense of well-being in the world is mixed up in this place, yeah? Um, at the, pers at, the, at the broader level, housing is one of the fundamental components of what makes for a thriving community, a resilient community. It's interconnected with good public schools, with meaningful jobs that pay a meaningful wage, with food systems and urban agriculture, where people have access to decent things to eat. Yeah. A decent public transportation system. Yeah. So this is all part of a system of what makes a community thrive and pegs the well-being for ourselves and our children and, and those that live around us. So being informed by these things, um, the Housing Justice League was formed. We had our first meeting in January of this year. And there's 37 organizations that are participating. Uh, 27 of them are members, about 13 or 14, who um, participate on a regular basis. Um, we have kind of a, a dual sort of strategy going on. Uh, about 12 of our members are formerly part of the City of Chicago's advisory committee to develop the five-year plan for 2019 to 2023. Um, but we also, so we're trying to affect the plan within the planning process. Um, the first draft plan, the city has been engaging us for about three months now. The first draft of the plan is coming out October the 3rd and is supposed to be approved by the mayor and city council before the end of the year. Now, whether that happens in October, November, December, we don't, we don't know. But we also, because we are focusing on people-centered policies, um, we also have a, an outside strategy where we're engaging the community in forums like this. As Wesley said, this is the seventh of seven forums. Uh, we've had them all over the city, in Pilsen, in Belmont Cragen, in Logan Square, in Bronzeville, etc. Albany Park, where we've engaged people at all different levels to get their ideas and their input and to get them energized that a five-year housing plan isn't just a dormant piece of paper, that there's real money and real sources and real jobs 
and real things that happen from these things. All right, so that being said, um, let's see if I can do this. Da -da. Um, I first wanted to show you the, these are the principles, the priorities of the mayor. So when the five-year planning process began this past spring, the very first meeting of the advisory council, um, we were presented very first thing. These are the mayor's priorities. Um, it's interesting to note that the bottom four have been there pretty consistently throughout the years, but what's different this time is the top one, avoiding displacement. I think you can guess why, yeah? You look at any number of neighborhoods in Chicago and not only the, the flight of African Americans and Latinos from Chicago, but um, some neighborhoods are under sort of open takeover. Uh, Pilsen is a good example, there are others. Um, some neighborhoods have already changed. Um, does Wicker Park today look like it did 10 years ago? Now, and in some ways that's good, but in some ways, what became of the people who no longer live there? Okay, so those are the mayor's priorities. Hard to disagree, hard to disagree. The question is not about that, it's about what we're gonna do about it, I suppose. Um, and so here are the 11 principles of the Housing Justice League. You have in your registration materials something that looks like this. This is the text of our principles and our 19 recommendations to the city. And behind these 19 recommendations, each of them has a full write-up um, that goes into much greater detail. And th that's what we have submitted to the city. So you can peruse that in your own time as you are skimming it here. Um, but in that very first one, when we talk about safe and healthy and decent housing, um, we really mean that not just as a generalization about the world, but we mean it about a public health aspect. Yeah? Because we know that one cause of uh, uh, the, the lack of repair of, in rental housing and maintenance on home ownership um, causes health problems for people going to work, for children going to school, um, and is an important component of developing uh, a whole health system. Okay, so uh, uh, going along with those principles, um, We want to just quickly go through our 19 recommendations. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time in each. You have them in your packet, but I want you to get a sense of the kind of things that these 37 organizations have thought deeply about. Um, first is to pass an ordinance like seven states and 23 cities around the United States requiring that evictions happen for cause. Yeah. That you can't simply just terminate somebody's relationship and evict them. Community benefits agreements. I, I think some of you are aware of what's happening with the Obama Center on the South Side and uh, the need of those citizens and those groups to directly benefit from that development and not simply be di displaced by it. So someone might ask, well, where are we gonna get the money on a $26 billion uh, problem? And part of the answer is, is that some TIF money is being spent in areas that are not blighted. And it's been controversial in Chicago for decades, and we think that it's time to re-divert those funds. You've heard all of us talk about things being done with a racial equity lens. That's not just a platitude. There is a way that you can actually do that. There is a checklist that has been developed in many cities, for example, in Minneapolis, where development decisions are checked against whether or not they're being racially sensitive and appropriate. And so this is a very specific operational kind of program and not merely a platitude. Um, there was a demonstration program in, in Albany Park, uh, spearheaded by Communities United, where we took a look and we said, um, if you look at all the two to four unit buildings in Chicago, the north side, the west side, the south side, it's thousands and thousands of units. And those units are typically larger, suitable for families. You notice all these new buildings going up around transit stations in Chicago. It's almost exclusively um, 
uh, one bedrooms or efficiencies. Right? If you have a child, where is it that you're supposed to live? Yeah? So um, understand the need to upgrade units, be appropriate for families. Um, so one of the programs that the city has now adopted that Roots project from Albany Park and is trying to make it citywide. And of course, what we think the key is, is to really put some money into it, where we, we're calling for the rehabilitation of 5,000 units across the city in a five-year period, which is nearly $400 million, um, and require as a condition that those units be kept affordable for a minimum of 10 years. Um, actually, we're plugging for it to be a longer period of time. All right. Um, lead remediation project. Um, we know that uh, the Chicago Department of Public Health has worked with the University of Chicago on a targeting program for lead remediation so that we can be proactive about dealing with lead. Because as many of you know, right now we have a reactive model. A doctor has to diagnose a child that then triggers certain dominoes, um, but uh, uh, we're looking at a, a more proactive sense. Um, Full-blown lead remediation could come under a proactive rental inspection program um, that it exists in many, many, many cities across the United States. Um, yeah, we don't think that necessarily where we've been since 1980 of relying on the private market and incentivizing the profit motive, we don't think that that has suited us well as a people. Um, we're not. We're talking about investments in public housing again. This ain't your granddaddy's public housing. Um, we're talking about a new wave of looking at public housing. Okay, I'm gonna skip over some of these. Um, so here's, here's a controversial one. Uh, that in lieu of fee that Kevin talked about of $175,000, you don't have to build the unit, you have to pay into this fund that hopefully at some point will build a unit somewhere, yeah. Um, uh, we think that's rubbish. Um, we think you got to build the unit. And 10% is far too low. 10% with a buyout clause is a vehicle for gentrification. It's a vehicle by, for cultural gentrification and economic gentrification. Because when you displace a gang of people and then you only replace it by 10%, it actually speeds up gentrification. So we're calling for a minimum of 30% affordability. You have to do it on site right there. You can't buy your way out of it, which means now that the city uses that money from the in lieu of fees to pay for other housing programs, you're not gonna have that money anymore. What do we think you ought to do? Take it away from unblighted areas in TIF. Yeah, okay. Um, we agree with Kevin's organization. We ought to increase the Low Income Housing Trust Fund. Certain basic civil rights ideas about not holding criminal histories over people's head when it comes to a fundamental human need. Um, only about 2% of all the units in Chicago are uh, handicapped accessible. Uh, that needs to change. People with disabilities, uh, whether wheelchair bound or otherwise, um, uh, shouldn't have to struggle to the extent that they do. They ought to have places that they can live and thrive in life rather than struggle. Um, okay, so um, we get to some ideas about um, ownership. Why does ownership always have to be about appreciating equity? Yeah. Why can't a fundamental human need be about stability and not an investment? Yeah. So one way to start getting at that is to say, why can't people own their own buildings? Why can't people manage their own buildings? And why shouldn't we, the people, be taking our money to do that? Okay. So some nonprofit organization, like the Northwest Side Housing Center, are using money to um, buy up foreclosed properties, tax sale properties. Uh, and other properties to then make them affordable for families in their neighborhoods. Similar home ownership program in Bronzeville we're supporting. All right. And then we looked at the mayor's um, five levels of priorities, but we added a sixth when you see it on the sheet. And our sixth priority is that we the people ought to have a priority on democratizing decision making. Yeah. 
if housing is a basic human need and it means oh so much more than that for everybody, then maybe it ought to be a basic human right. It is not. As a lawyer, rights are things that one can enforce. Yeah. It is not a basic human right and maybe we need to start treating it that way. Um, and, but when it comes to development decisions of any sort, we ought to be trying to democratize the landscape. There's no reason why your aldermen should sit in a private meeting with a handful of personally selected people and make decisions about your neighborhood without your knowledge or participation. There's just no reason for that. Yeah. It means we'll have to engage. Yeah, that's the other side. Turn off the football game and engage. Yeah. Um, all right. So uh, we go a step beyond. Uh, we'd like to see people in Chicago rehab network benefit maybe even more than they think for themselves. We think that their status as nonprofit, mission driven developers ought to get extra points when the city scores grant applications. They ought to get credit for that. They ought to be preferred for the expenditure of our money. Yeah. Uh, tenants right now in, under Illinois and Chicago law do not have a right to organize. They have certain back-end protections against retaliation, but they don't have a right independent of that. Um, we are, of course, living in an era of climate change, and we need to start behaving that way. The Great Lakes are going to be viewed as a place of refuge for environmental refugees from the Southwest and from the Gulf Coast. Um, we're not talking about our children's generation, we're talking about during our lifetimes. So how are we gonna handle the housing and transportation and food system demands of an influx of refugees? And um, who gets to make those decisions and how are they going to be made? Okay, so, um, I just want to end by uh, quickly pointing out that uh, these uh, materials are again in your packet. If you're interested in the work of the Housing Justice League, uh, let us know. Um, Wesley's been involved and, and others here have been involved. And uh, again, some critical dates are coming up with the city's housing planning process. October 3 is when they unveil their plan. Hopefully we will be able to uh, work up to that point and after that point to try to get some people-centered, people-oriented programs and policies. But the big, big, big message, the city right now has a lot of good housing plans, a lot of good housing programs. We're recommending that some of those things be augmented. Um, we're recommending that some new things be added on. But if things continue to be funded at a level that isn't purposeful and meaningful, then it's just window dressing. Yeah. Um, to have purposeful and meaningful change, hopefully done in a democratic manner, um, we need to put a lot more money at the housing question because it is the center of other things that make community development happen. Okay, thanks. Morning, everyone. My name is Leah. I'm the director of a citywide uh, direct action organizing coalition for affordable housing called the Chicago Housing Initiative. We are made up of 11 community-based organizations that engage everyday people and families in the work to fight for housing justice um, in a grassroots way. Um, you know, I don't know how to work these things. This is very technologically advanced. Um, <laughs> This is our mission. Um, so I've been asked to talk a little bit about um, the scope of the housing problem and who it affects and how many people it affects, how basic housing systems are failing us in Chicago and why, and then a little bit most importantly what we can do about it. But I think I'll just save that because that'll probably come out in the course of everyone's remarks and we can take it as a discussion. Um, am I right that most of the people in the room are public health folks? So a lot of folks focus on public health. Okay, we can actually, show of hands, I'm just interested. Are, is it a public health room? Okay, fantastic. Um, so I just wanna say thank you for the work that you guys do. Um, I think a lot of us are here because we believe that humans have certain basic and alienable rights and dignity, and I just really appreciate folks working on those human rights in other areas that I don't have the capacity to work on. So 
I've touched that issue for the last 15 years through the housing lens, and I just want to say thank you for the work you're doing um, on human rights through the public health lens. So thank you for that. Um, okay, so a little bit about just like what's up with affordable housing? What's the need here? Um, it's a pretty basic issue. Uh, the prices for housing are escalating and intensifying dramatically and swiftly, and wages aren't keeping pace. So if we take a snapshot at some of the communities that used to be sanctuaries that provided some affordability for families in Chicago, thinking about a Pilsen or a Bronzeville, the median price right, for a two-bedroom apartment now is $1,400 even in those communities. I can't afford that. I don't know about you, right? I have a full-time, decent nonprofit job. Um, and then other communities, it just gets higher and higher, right? Um, Lincoln Park, $2,000 for a two-bedroom. Buck, Bucktown, $2,600. South Loop, $2,800, right? That's median prices, and that's actually 2017 data. It's worse now. Um, versus incomes, what's going on with incomes? They're not going up much, at least not for the lowest wage families in our society who we all count on every day, right? Um, so Chicago's minimum wage, as folks know right now, $12 per hour. That means that a full-time minimum wage worker is bringing home just under $2,000 a month, um, which is just about $23,000 a year. Can you imagine raising a whole family on that, right? It's insane. Um, so what type of housing prices could a family in that sector afford, right? More like $500, $600 a month in rent, and that is nowhere to be found in the city, right? Um, so just in terms of numbers, we've got 97,000 families with children who are making less than $35,000 a year. The majority of these families will end up paying over half of their income for rent every month, meaning that they're choosing between basic necessities, right? And you guys, you guys see this choice, I think, on the other side of folks as they come looking for medical care, right? And they struggle to afford that as well, but it's, it's often trade-offs between these basic human necessities. Do I pay for rent or do I pay for medicine, right? Do I pay for rent or do I pay for food, right? That's the situation that a lot of our uh, neighbors find themselves in. Um, and then just in terms of scope of the need to take a snapshot, right, because I, you guys might not be encountering this issue every day. Um, the last time the Chicago Housing Authority opened its waiting list, over 280,000 families applied for 40,000 places in line, right? That's not units, they don't get housed they get a place on a waiting list, and then maybe 10 years later, they win that lottery and they get housed. Right? So it's a pretty dire situation. That's roughly one in every four families in Chicago seeking housing assistance, just to put that in perspective. Right? So pretty big scale. Um, I would say that those things are symptoms, right? I'm gonna use this analogy of folks here in the health fields, right? Those are symptoms. What are the actual driving factors? Like, what's the underlying disease, right? What's the underlying issues that push this crisis into the proportions that it is? So, so one, I mean, and this is obviously like my last Chicago Housing Initiatives analysis, but treating housing in a, as an investment rather than a basic human need. Financially, it is actually possible to provide good, high-quality housing at a price of $800 to $1,000 a month if you're not thinking about the profit motive, right? I, I live in a limited equity housing cooperative that I helped found about seven years ago. We can provide high quality housing that is very sustainable um, and we're entirely crowded, but we can do that at a far lower price point than if we were doing this based on like a marketized system, right? Um, so when you insert the profit motive and when you make housing provision something that um, only happens when the private capital market has an incentive to produce it for profit, right? You're going to see prices increase, right? So there's an operating cost based rent, which is far lower, right? You can do that for 800, sometimes $600 a month, right? Depending on how you treat capital repairs. And then there's a market based rent, which is the figures that we looked at before a few slides ago, right? So the fact that we're treating this as a commodity and funding it as a commodity changes the economics of it significantly. So far, so good. Okay. There are other ways to do this, right? But this is the way that America is doing it. Um, intensifying income inequality. So these are broader social trends, but that translates into, in a, uh, a capitalist housing market, self-segregates economically, right? And so if you have intensifying in income inequality with very high income, high wealth people, 
and very impoverished, low wealth people, you are going to see the society divide dramatically into regions of extreme privilege and like elite conditions and all the luxuries in the world and then other regions in the city that are just sacrifice zones, right? Um, they are like economic, geopolitical sacrifice zones where people have nothing, the infrastructure is inadequate, right? So income inequality then, and, and the, the way that increases is changing the social fabric, right? In ways that I think our, our fundamental values would have us <laughs> question, right? Like, is this, is the trajectory here, right? Of income inequality and then deepening segregation, actually, economic and racial. Is that the trajectory that we as a society want to be on based on our values? And if it's not, there are like very profound interventions that we're going to need to make to change that because the system is going to structurally reproduce that. It's like built into the fabric of how we're doing things here. Um, Frank covered this, and as a Kevin, federal and local defunding of affordable housing. And then um, just talking about the rising market rents, that's kind of related to the commodification question, but um, I wanna draw one other factor out here just to get us to like a systems analysis. When you have a intensifying rent structure, and you combine that with the privatization of our affordable housing programs, right? So we no longer really have public housing in this country, right? We have privatized programs that often cost a market-based rent to the public, if not to the tenant, right? A market-based rent structure that then serve low-income families where the family pays 30% of their income, but that's not what the owner, the private owner gets. The owner gets market-based rent, right? So if you think about that from a systems perspective, Imagine that, imagine that to, to subsidize a family to live in Lincoln Park, what were the numbers here? What? So we, under the Project-Based Section 8 program or the Section 8 voucher program, we, the collective, end up paying $2,000, and we should to help a family live there, right? We want families to be able to have choice about where they live, true choice about where they live, but because of the privatization of every affordable housing program, pretty much, in Chicago and the nation at this point, the cost to do that is unnecessarily high, right? We are, what we could do at a cost of $600 per unit, $800 per unit, $1,000 per unit, we are now paying double, triple that, right? Because of the way our housing programs have been privatized. I just wanna pause here and see, are people following this? Okay, so for the same amount of money that the federal government invested, uh, invests now, right? Uh, 10 years ago, we used to serve, I think it's, it's like 25% uh, more households for the same dollar value, right? Um, but that same level of investment is now serving fewer and fewer families because privatization makes serving every family far more expensive, okay? So the long-term trajectory of this, like if you extrapolate out 10 years, is we're in a very unsustainable system and we need to fight for rent control. <laughs> so I'm just gonna correct the earlier statement that was made by a, a peer and a colleague. Like we need rent control. We need to fight for rent control. Um, because otherwise our affordable housing system will continue to become more and more unsustainable. We, we cannot subsidize our way out of this crisis under any circumstances, but particularly not if we don't have rent control, okay? Um, cool, so driving factors. Um, that's kind of broad, broad based. Local factor that we've worked a lot on at Chicago Housing Initiative as a coalition. The plan for transformation, which has redeveloped CHA's public housing significantly. Um, we have seen a very severe loss of public and affordable housing, and it's a planned loss under the plan for transformation. Um, so I won't go through all the numbers, but it, is, it has been a deep blow to the access to affordable housing. And while clearly the way the public housing system was being uh, managed and funded was not providing the quality of housing that it should or the quality of community that it should to the current tenants, the way the plan for transformation was constructed has resulted in a massive net loss of affordable housing units, and we need to figure out something that preserves what we have remaining, at least. Um, I will, overall impact, um, and then I'll kind of uh, shift to like, what are some ways that we can intervene in these systems? Uh, folks probably know we've lost 200,000 black residents, uh, no, more at this point, but during the last census cycle, we lost 200,000 black residents from the city. 
pushed out of this city, right? No longer part of our city, no longer able to raise their families in our city, no longer able to vote and exert political power in our city, right? It's a lot of change that ripples out from that. And the closure of the many, many public schools that we've lost is not disconnected from this fact, right? These are very integrated facts that when families are pushed out of their communities and pushed out of the city, it affects everything. It affects every major social institution and public institution. It deeply affects the schools. It affects churches, which are closing, right? Um, it's devastating, just like comprehensively devastating. Um, folks know this, but Latinx families is increasingly being pushed out of their historic communities further and further from the city center as well. Um, I'm going to close the slides and then just shift to, um, yes. Um, you might see that I don't know how to work technology. OK. Um, oh, oh, all right. Uh, no, OK. <laughs> um, so yeah, scope of the problem, driving factors in the problem. This is some, some deep shit, guys. Like, <laughs> this is not like superficial issues that we're going to like show up and rah, 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 and, and they're going to be solved, though we need to show up and rah, 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 right? But this is kind of long-term systematic work that we need to do very thoughtfully. Um, so just a kind of a recap here of the housing systems failing us, right? I would say there's, there's three areas that we need interventions. Um, area one, we need to defend and protect public housing. Um, I understand that we need to find a right and better way to manage it than the history of what happened under, for example, Reagan and subsequent policies, but public ownership um, and investment or some similar structure is actually really important and we need something that gets to serving the lowest income families in our city. Um, and public housing can be successful, we have seen it be successful. Um, area two, like a moderate income tier, um, inclusionary zoning, which is the affordable requirements ordinance, uh, or should be. Um, it is possible that when we upzone as a city, I'll just kind of cover the principles here, right? When a developer applies for upzoning, they buy a parcel of land zoned for a six lot, and then they want to build a 100 unit building, right? They have to get permission from the zoning committee and the city council to build that higher density. There can be a trade in that moment, right? where the city council, we as a city say, cool, you can extract profit from you know, 100 more units than you have the right to right now, but you need to give us something as a city. You need to give the public something in exchange for that, which is a completely reasonable principle for a city to articulate. Right? So the tool called inclusionary zoning is about making that trade for the public interest and making sure that when developers can make more profit off of apartments, um, the public gets something in exchange in the form of affordable family public housing. Um, and then third aspect, we need to do something to stabilize the market rents. We need rent control. I will say that to my dining room. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you. So I think that uh, Leah Levinger, the director of the Chicago Housing Initiative, now is during the panel. And uh, let me quickly introduce the other people on the panel. Clara Brian Sincho, former executive director of the Pilsen Alliance, brought my room and their focus. Um, also, Christian Diaz, housing organizer at the Logan Square Neighborhood Association, deeply involved in the whole 606 uh, uh, fight there. Uh, Jackie Grimshaw is, of course, uh, the vice president of governmental affairs for the Center of Neighborhood Technology. And I've always appreciated the work that they're trying to do um, with uh, equitable transit-oriented development. And maybe she'll tell us a little bit more about that. Um, but I wanted to start out by just asking uh, first, uh, we, we, we've heard all the speakers address the problem that we have with race and class equity in Chicago and indeed nationwide. Um, but how do you feel, for example, uh, Byron, let me start with you. Um, how do you feel that these structural inequities of race or class actually hinder access to high quality, safe, and decent housing? Um, I, oh, that's work. Okay. 
Um, so, well, first of all, you know, good morning and buenos dias. I think it's a pleasure, you know, to be here with you know more people to talk about uh, structural disparities, especially when it comes and it relates not only to housing but the implications, uh, you know, that, that represent of the lack of, you know, in terms of healthcare as well. Um, you know, what I'll, I'll say, you know, I, would, I always like to tell stories because I think the stories are very compelling that add to the data, right? I think the data is very telling, but I do think it's uh, more critical to see what that means to families, right? What it means to people on the ground. And I think the Pilsen Alliance, I think for the last 10 years, I think personally, I think 20 years doing this work, uh, we've seen the situation worsen, you know? Um, in terms of housing, we see more homelessness, we see more families displaced in Pilsen, 10,000 residents, 5,000 evictions. Uh, I mean, the situation is massive. And what it means for families, are low-income residents especially, uh, and the implications it has on their well-being are, are uh, atrocious. You know, I think um, I would like to share the story of a family who uh, was in an affordable housing building. Uh, they had teenager kids. And unfortunately, because of uh, their health conditions, one of the fam one of the parents lost their job. Um, as a result, the, the income was um, be became more became tighter, you know, to make ends meet. One of the teenager kids uh, ends up having to work, and then so all of a sudden, um, there was an issue with how much money they make as a family. This family ends up being displaced from this affordable housing building with a medical condition and lived in a car for over a year, right? Now, what it did to the family is more problematic, right? Because I think Lea has been very clear on you know, what it does to, her, um, to schools, right? When families leave the communities, the enrollments in Pilsen alone are in all-time lows. I think that there's no, no secret to that as families continue to leave for the lack of investment. The family gets split because now the, the family is looking for a shelter and they can no longer take care of uh, two, two teenager kids. The oldest ends up taking care of the youngest and the family all of a sudden is split with the parents with a medical condition living in a car. The situation not only got worse, it was tragic. After a year, because of the medical condition, the father passed away. Now, those are the stories that we see at the grassroots level, right? When, when, when we talk about housing as a human right, when we talk about the importance of fighting these fights at, at the structural level, it's because we see many of these stories repeating, you know? The shelters, now, we, now the shelters that we have now are shut down, right? A lot of the shelters that we had in Pilsen, one recently was closed. And, you know, the youth that sometimes find refuge are also being defunded. Right? Either it's at the state level or the city level. So in Pilsen, another, show, another program that serve youth at risk, in, in particular are youth at risk that, or youth are, um, are dealing with domestic violence issues, that also was shut down. Now, that's the structural problems that we have to deal with because the situation gets worse and worse. I, told, I, I said in the last 10 years, we've seen these stories you know, and I can go on and on on the tragic stories that we see. And we don't see any investment in, in addressing this problem. In fact, there being a disinvestment that has come to just the peak of levels. I, I, I think that um, the number of homeless people in our community, and I don't know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that many of you uh, have seen the situation getting worse and worse. You know, and, and the situation, I'm talking about families now, I want to talk about what happened, you know, with the homeless population, right? Ten City, I mean, I'm sure, people, you know, when there was this place on uptown, right, many people looking for shelter now across the city, so there's an encampment in, in a near, near our community now. So the medical conditions, you know, of being homeless, chronic, chronic homelessness is a massive problem in terms of health. A uh, few weeks ago, we saw an elder. This is a 65-year-old person who needed medical treatment because he had a massive fall and had complications with the lower back. Now, the, the gentleman couldn't walk and couldn't receive medical attention for weeks, right? So, you know, the lack of access to, to this, kind of, um, this kind of situations and the emergency situations that they're receiving right now is not adequate. So they may receive emergency, emergency help 
for a short period of time, and they're back on the street. So that's not going to solve the problem with this, this human being. So I'm just telling you some stories because I think that was back the data that lay and many, many of the same. But at the grassroots level, that's what we see coming to our office on a daily basis. So to address these structural issues, we need to have structural solutions. And that has to do with, like I think Frank mentioned many of them, you know, but ultimately it requires political willingness to make it happen. Because we have many, many, in Pilsen we have a, an affordable requirement ordinance that doubles the minimum in the city, is 21%. But yet the developers continue to get away with it and they pay in lieu fees to not allocate affordable housing units. In the 25th world alone, in our, in our area, over $3 million of in lieu fees in the last few years. That money never came back to the community to create affordable housing when we have a housing crisis. So that's the funding that happens behind doors. And, that's, and that money has not even been accounted for. I think the mayor still has to explain what he's doing with the money. You know, but what we see also is more and more of those resources going to luxury housing. Now, how can we, in a society with so many resources, allocate money for luxury housing when we see our people literally dying? To me, that's immoral and criminal. So, and I, and I end with this problem with the structural problems. Recently, the city, and it's not, you know, this is not, this is not, these are facts. Right? A luxury housing developer recently, that's just a week ago. So people say, oh, that's just you know from back in the day. I'm talking about a week ago. Came to the community and proposed that the city subsidizes a luxury housing development. Now let's process that, right? When we talked about all these stories, the structural problems. That we in a community that is seeing this investment in the schools, in youth, in senior centers that we subsidize luxury housing. Now, they went as far as paying $135,000 for consultants to come and tell us what we already know. <laughs> that is what we discussed today. Now, in what mind that does that make any sense? <laughs> when we don't have resources for shelters, for youth at risk, for affordable housing, but there's $135,000 to pay for consultants to come and tell us something we already know. Now, that's the a, that's a kind of things that are, I think is structural. And I think like, you know, we can, you know, in terms of like, I don't know, at some point maybe I can talk to another Chicago Homeless um, Coalition, is anybody here representing them? But there's some wonderful initiatives about how we can tax the real estate industry. And in terms of revenue, they're wonderful ideas. What we don't have is someone who's listening in City Hall. Byron, thank you. And um, if you're into string theory, you know that there's a parallel universe. Um, the, uh, uh, we, we talk about the interconnectedness of things in neighborhoods with housing and health, et cetera. And I wonder if I could get Jackie for a minute to uh, tell us a little bit about how transportation uh, affects stable neighborhoods and the health in those neighborhoods. Uh, thank you, Frank. And uh, thank you uh, to all the folks here at Health and Policy that uh, put the forum together and invited us here today. So, um, you know, part of the answer you've heard already this morning, uh, if people are housing, a house bur burden in terms of paying for basic uh, needs or a place to live, then there is little money for other things. And healthcare is one of those things that tends to suffer. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we work on at the Center for Neighborhood Technology is the relationship of affordability based upon the cost of transportation. Uh, and, you know, if, you know, one I think that Kevin said this morning is that one of the things that when you have a stable place, then you have the ability to do other things. You have the ability to access a job. You have the ability to uh, be able to afford health care, to be able to afford education. But if you are house burden and you then have a transportation to get to a job, uh, that is unaffordable as well to uh, someone making minimum wage, then you really have a, a squeeze on the budget and the ability to afford health care. So one of the things that we like to say is that you've heard all morning that housing affordability is 30% of income. 
Well, we like to add the cost of transportation to that. Now, transportation ideally is it it, it 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 is the second largest household expense, but ideally should be no more than fifteen to twenty percent. So if you add thirty and fifteen or twenty, then you're talking about forty five to fifty percent of a family's income just going to those two basic things, housing and transportation. Uh, and so then everything else is in the re the remainder. But as you've also heard, is that people are spending more than 30% of their income for, for housing. So you start to see how a household budget is really squeezed. And one of the things that happens is that, you know, people find other ways of, of existing, you know, an informal uh, economy that people have to rely on in order to be able to survive. Uh, and, you know, that causes all kinds of other social dysfunctions. So, so the, the relationship, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to ignore housing, transportation, health care, food, uh, education, that, you know, like how do people exist on $12 an hour? Thank you, Jackie. And I, I want to ask Christian, as a housing organizer in, in Logan Square, um, one of the questions that uh, everyone discussed with your partner uh, a little while ago here, um, how can we bridge the housing and public health silos? It, do you find in your organizing work that um, those that are concerned about uh, public health and those who are concerned about housing are working together uh, or not, and, and how might they work more closely together? Yeah, <clears throat> I, I think if you're looking at public health, if you're looking at public education, if you're looking at any public institution that contributes to a, a full life, um, a life that offers dignity to people in our city, uh, then you have to recognize that in, in order to access good quality health, in order to access good quality schools, um, you need to have stable housing. In order to access jobs, right? Um, in order to access transportation, in order to, to uh, <coughs> feel a sense of belonging in your community. There's just so many different aspects of one's mental health, physical health, that are impacted by housing stability. And I wanna take a step back and just share a little bit about um, what's been happening in Logan Square. So my mother brought me to this country when she was a teenager. She came to this country as a single mom, uh, looking for this American dream, right, that we hear so much about, that if you work hard, you're gonna make it in this country, you're gonna live a life of dignity. Um, and we eventually came to Logan Square. And when we moved to Logan Square, it was a kind of community where even if you didn't speak English, you could access everything that you needed to live a, a well-rounded life. There were churches that, were, that gave sermon in Spanish. Um, there were jobs where, where you, could, you could speak Spanish and work there. Um, grocery stores. Uh, it was it was very much a community with a lot of different layers of of mutual community support. And uh, you know, my my stepdad, he's from Mexico City. And one thing to know about people from Mexico City is that they feel like there aren't enough hours in the day to work because they just want to work all the time. Um, and uh, what this meant for me and my family is that my stepdad brought me to work with him um, as a kid, right? I was like 11. We started working at the Chicago Sun-Times where we would go at like 2 a.m. to the Sun-Times factory and roll up the newspaper, put it in a little blue plastic bag and then deliver it to our turf. And our turf was Lincoln Park. And so I think around that age is when I started to notice that my community looked different from other communities in Chicago. And I started to ask why. For a long time, I saw Logan Square. I saw uh, how, the, how the neighborhood, in some ways, felt like it was falling apart. The, the schools um, were overcrowded. And it definitely felt very different from what I experienced walking in Lincoln Park delivering newspapers. And for a long time, I thought that maybe there was something wrong with me, or something wrong with my family, or something wrong with my community. Um, it wasn't until I went to college that I realized that the reason that we have such inequality in our city and in our country 
is a direct result of public policy. The, the way, you know, the problems that Byron described in Pilsen, that didn't happen naturally overnight. The way that 19,000 Latinos have been displaced from Logan Square, that, that didn't happen on its own. What we're seeing in the city is a direct result of public policy. And if you're interested in health policy or education policy or really a any of these institutions that contribute to, to a person's quality of life, that you have to understand that stability in housing is where that starts. If you don't have stable housing, then, then how are you going to access those, uh, those services that you need? Um, so, so I think what I want to challenge uh, people working in public health to do is to see the fight for affordable housing, for housing stability for families as a health fight as well. And I'm asking that for the sectors that work around schools and education. I'm really asking that anybody who's a public advocate recognize that stability in housing is at the root of the problem that you're trying to solve. And if, and if we address problems in housing and stability, then we're going to increase people's quality of life in all these ways. Thank you, Christian. We're going to open it up for question and answer in just a minute. But before we do, I wanted to um, see if uh, we could get each of the panelists for just maybe two minutes apiece to tell us what they think the most impactful thing we might be able to do as a city. Um, if you were to sit Mayor Emanuel down and say, I want you to do this one thing because it'll have the most meaningful impact on the quality of life with people's housing and health. Um, Leah, what, what would you recommend? Just within the mayor's power right at this moment? Uh, well, I don't, I don't want to put you in that box, but um, <laughs> what would you recommend that we, uh, we as Chicago might do? Um, so I do think that the, the most pervasive far-reaching thing that we could do is establish some form of rent control or rent stabilization. But we can't do that as a city uh, just yet because there is a statewide ban across the state of Illinois um, that prevents us from even having a conversation with our older people and our mayor about rent control right now. Um, but I say that because that trickles down to affect every other system um, and how much it costs to provide housing um, because of that factor that all of our affordable housing programs just about are, are privatized and marketized. Um, so in terms of a long range game changer, I do think that that is the most, uh, the thing that we can do that will have the most ripple effects um, systematically for the most families, um, improve stability and improve affordability and improve our access, our ability to uh, produce and provide affordable housing through public subsidy um, more systematically. But we can't do it yet at the city level. We have to win it at the state level before we can win it at the city level. So, so Jackie, it's kind of leaving Mayor Emanuel off the hook right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jackie, let me ask you, what, what do you think uh, the most impactful thing that we could do as a city that would improve the quality of life with housing and health in neighborhoods? Well, um, Kevin promised um, in response to a question he got that the answer would probably be discussed in this panel, so I want to talk about it. And the question was, you know, how, how do we get the alderman out of deciding about whether or not we have affordable housing? Mm. And so for me, the answer is getting rid of automatic prerogatives. Mm. Because that is a source that keeps affordable housing out of communities. Uh, it is the reason why um, the, 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 the developers are able to go in and negotiate um, increased uh, densities uh, so that they can make bigger profits, the privatization that we had talked about. Um, so, you know, being a public policy person, I always get to who makes the decision. And the decisions are made by the mayor and the aldermen, and the aldermen are the ones that are, you know, have their big thumb on the scale that keeps us from having. Uh, the affordable housing and getting to 
uh, equity, which is really what we want to have. You know, I really didn't talk about and answer your earlier question about the work we do on equitable TLD. You know, TLD has gotten a bad name because of all of these luxury high rises and efficiency and one bedrooms costing two thousand dollars and things of that sort. So, you know, living near transit is important uh, in terms of of access to jobs and and being able to live without having to rely on expensive transportations like an automobile. But, you know, if the housing is not affordable, or people who are living right now and are naturally incurring, I mean, our city was built around our, our transit system. Uh, if people are being pushed away from affordable transportation uh, and affordable housing, then, you know, that that's contributing to the, to the, the inequities in the city. So, anyway. That's a long answer to saying get rid of automatic prerogative. And we can do that. I mean, it's an advocacy issue that we, as citizens of the city, can work on advocating to get rid of that. But we have to have the, our own political will to do it. Thank you, Jackie. And I, um, uh, I would then ask Byron the question of, of is there a single thing, Byron, that you would recommend that we could do as a city um, to make our neighborhoods more healthy and thriving neighborhoods where people could live. Yeah, and I think um, I will for I will follow what the major the mayor has said in terms of well that we have a housing problem, so he created his uh, housing department, right? Um, obviously, he does he always does stuff during election year, but you know then the other three years he forgets about it. So what I would like to ask him is to. To make sure that he, he follows what the commitments are in terms of the creation of more affordable housing, right? He has tons of pilot programs, I don't, you know, who receive that he's not committed to. Um, so I think that we need to create more affordable housing, and the way to create affordable housing is very clear, and he knows it. You know, I think that we propose the 30% ARO. I think that's something that is not radical at all. I think that making sure that we follow those guidelines to create affordable housing is critical. We have the resources to create more affordable housing. Uh, what we don't have is his willingness to do it, quite frankly. I do think that ha that work, I think one thing that we need to ask him is to make sure that the affordable housing creation is a priority so that we put the 30% and we don't let the developers off the hook by these loopholes, but also put public resources to make sure that that's a reality. He's creating a department to do this. So the demand, and it's not an ask, is to make sure that he puts the resources with his mouth is right now. What is, we have the CHA sitting in two, over $200 million right now that we can put to address the homelessness uh, situation, the lack of affordable housing, so that we have the resources. And I do think that there's gonna be more initiatives coming up. I think that also another thing that we can generate resources is taxing as a minimum tax for real estate trans transactions that it happens in other cities. Real estate transactions of, for mansions of over $1 million that can maybe generate some revenue to address homelessness. It happens in other cities while we don't have it here. That is what is gonna stop one thing that we like to add is that we need to stop this, this, this uh, tale of two cities that is real, this, it, it's really shame. We should not accept that. Housing is a human right. So when we are generate, when, when the city is creating more mansions, in Pilsen it, it, it is heartbreaking. When you see like more teardowns because of the zoning and the corruption that goes with zoning, and then literally next to the mansions, foot step away are you know, people living on the streets. We should not tolerate that. So I do think that if we can address that by creating affordable housing and make sure that those new mansions pay to address the homelessness, there's nothing radical about it. That's, that's, what, that's what we can start doing immediately. So Christian, what would you like to see happen to make Logan Square and other neighborhoods healthier and more stable? I think I, I would love to challenge the mayor to see how the very architecture of our society is fundamentally racist, especially as it pertains to housing. And by racist, I mean that uh, housing policy and policy in general is designed to move power and resources away from communities of color and concentrate it into white communities. And I know this because between the 1930s and 1960s, the government federally guaranteed mortgages for white people, but not for people of color. Um, earlier in our history, the government provided free college education to white men. And what does that mean generations later? 
It means that we have this incredible disparity between white people and people of color. And so how do we solve this problem? To me, it's not a mystery because we know what worked. We know what worked for white people, right? We know that federally guaranteeing home ownership worked, right? Making home ownership affordable worked. Providing free college education worked for white people. It would work for communities of color as well. It's not a big mystery to me. And it's definitely not a big mystery to the mayor. I don't think the mayor wants people of color to have power or resources. Um, I would also challenge him to think structurally about property taxes. I mean, this explosive report that came out um, last year demonstrated that on average, people of color's properties are overassessed, meaning that they have to pay more in property taxes, while white communities and their properties have been systematically underassessed. What this means is that through the property tax system, there has been a transfer of wealth from poor people and from communities of color to white people in wealthy communities, and I think that's disgusting. And I think we should reverse that. I think we should be <laughs> over-assessing wealthy neighborhoods and shifting those resources to the communities that need them. But, you know, maybe this is a conspiracy theory on my part. I think, I think you know, Frank mentioned how, how climate change is a reality that's gonna impact Chicago. And if you look at the demographic changes in Chicago recently, you'll notice that, um, you know, we have this really, this sad reality of black families having to leave Chicago. Mm -hmm. Why? Because their schools were closed. Why? Because there are no resources or investment in their communities. Um, and what I think is happening is that, you know, Ram is thinking 30 years from now, 40 years from now. People, in the, the elites are, right? And I think that Chicago will be a safe haven for wealthy people in the future who want to escape the, the realities and the dangers of climate change. And so, and so I, I do think that, you know, with Logan Square, part of the gentrification process is letting a community deteriorate for a long time so that eventually these investors and these developers can scoop up properties kick people of color out of those communities and redevelop these communities into luxury communities. Um, think, about, think about Lincoln Yards and what the city's proposing there. Uh, last Thursday, we were part of a direct action where we were at the Lincoln Yard site questioning why is there a $5 billion investment coming into an already wealthy community and why are we using public dollars to subsidize this $5 billion investment? I think we need to challenge that I think um, I'm less concerned with what the mayor is going to do because we know what he's going to do because we have the last two terms um, to learn from. I want to know what all of you are going to do. And I want to challenge all of you, for the love of God, please make sure you're registered to vote. <laughs> please make sure your friends and family are registered to vote. And please make sure that they become regular voters and that you're, you know, we in this space are lucky and privileged to have the time in our lives to learn about these issues, to learn about these policies, to learn how government works. Um, a lot of our friends and family who are working class don't have that luxury. And so it's up to us to really talk to them and use our relationships with them to motivate them to vote and to take action because Rahm Emanuel is not gonna solve this problem. And I don't even know if any politician is gonna solve this problem. I think we need to solve this problem. So that's my call to action. Well, that, that's nine things I counted. Um, <laughs> and nine times four is, um, uh, well, uh, I'll throw in one just for the fun of it, um, something that's close to my heart and that of the Health and Medicine Policy Research Group as well. For um, almost two years, a collaborative of community groups and public health groups have been meeting uh, under the auspices of the Metropolitan Tenants Organization, the Loyola, uh, law School Children's Law Project, funded by the Environmental Protection Agency, to study um, how we might proactively address substandard housing. That group came out with a white paper showing um, how the health problems that relate to housing um, have a serious impact on education, on children, on job stability, etc. I can get that white paper from Wesley and others here. Um, we're, we're advocating that a proactive rental inspection regime be passed in Chicago. You don't need to have displacement to have development. 
you know, bring the quality of the housing stock up to a common level of decency over a decade or so. Um, uh, then we can lower the tensions between landlords and tenants. We can stabilize neighborhoods by giving everybody a long-term stake in the well-being of a neighborhood. So um, we're looking at a proactive rental inspection uh, model. You'll hear more about it in the press. But take a look at that white paper from January. All right, I want to open the floor up to some questions. What the heck? Yes, ma'am. I think you're going to get a microphone here. I think you said introduce myself too. So I'm Samantha Liu from, uh, I work at the University of Chicago at the Center for Health and the Social Sciences. I moved to Chicago uh, in the city in 2008 and I lived around Chicago for a long time. Uh, but in the first five years I lived here, the cost of living went up 20%, I believe, mm. uh, which to me seems like a lot of arbitrary rent increases. Mm. So um, I'm not that familiar with housing policy. I know rent control is not a thing here, but are there any policies in place that prevent lessors from raising the cost of rent uh, well above the rate of inflation? I guess as a lawyer in the group, I'll just give a simple answer. No. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <laughs> but but there are there are things we can do. Um, you know, I don't know. I don't know if this has been mentioned um, during the session, but when we think of affordable housing, we often think of subsidized housing, government subsidized housing. I think it's important to recognize that the affordable housing, at least in Logan Square, Avondale, and Hermosa, and parts of Humboldt Park, which is where I work, um, the actual affordable housing in our community is provided by low-income families who are homeowners who are renting to low other low-income uh, families. And so how do we support those homeowners? You know, you have to look at the three flats and the two flats. My parents, for example, bought a three flat in the 90s for like $150,000 in Logan Square. The people who live on the first floor are friends from back in Mexico who pay like 700 bucks. The people who live in the garden unit are my tia um, and, her, and her kids who pay like $650 a month. And the reason that, you know, we could, my family could easily jack up those prices um, based on the market r rates in the neighborhood, right? But because we have that personal connection, um, we keep the, the, the rents affordable. Um, but with property taxes going up and the cost of living in the city going up, you know, if my father lost his, his house, then those families would also be displaced and lose their affordable housing that's natural affordable housing. So we need to figure out policies that help preserve those um, buildings that are owned by low-income families and support those low-income families who provide naturally affordable housing to other families. Well, not to ring our own bell, um, uh, Christian, the um, proposal to spend $400 million mm -hmm. to uh, renovate and preserve 5,000 units in the two to fours by uh, helping those uh, modest income building owners mm -hmm. uh, uh, stabilize and survive so they can continue to rent at reasonable rates for um, families. Um, the important thing is spending the right amount of money. If you spend $10 million on that program, it's meaningless. It has to be something more serious. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. I have a question for you. So we know that with the ARO currently, um, the in lieu of fees that are being collected are going elsewhere. Um, in the new, my question is for those that are working on the current um, five-year plan: Is there a um, is there a plan to address, um, a, I guess, a requirement that require a percentage of that funding to be placed back into certain communities in order to ensure that those who are living in those communities are not displaced? I could take this one, or at least start the taking of it. Um, the the five-year plan, the city has indicated at present no appetite for reforms like that. Um, but um, the members of the Chicago Housing Initiative Coalition have introduced an ordinance called Development for All, the Development for All Ordinance, that would um, remove the ability of developers to opt out of the affordable housing requirements so that in areas experiencing development pressures, Hilson, Logan Square, Humboldt Park, we just get the affordable housing on site as part of the creation of the new market building. It doesn't, um, it's not a silver bullet at all to respond to gentrification, it's a small mitigation, but we do think that raising the, making the affordable housing mandatory, raising the percentage to 30% 
from the uh, discretionary 10% that it is right now, mandating the creation of family-sized units so that we don't just have, as Jackie said, studios getting produced right in these developing areas. It's, it's progress. It's not perfection, but it is progress. Um, so the state of play on the reforms that you were talking about to kind of produce a more inclusive way of doing development in developing areas, it's a legislative maneuver that we're making. We're trying to pass an ordinance um, through the City Council Housing Committee and then the City Council in its entirety. Um, key decision makers in that effort, if anyone lives in the 49th Ward, that's the ward of Alderman Joe Moore, who's the Housing Committee Chairman, who is refusing to even meet with us about this proposal. Um, or if anyone lives in South Shore, the 7th Ward, Greg Mitchell is the Vice Chairman of the City Council Housing Committee and also is refusing even a discussion at this moment. So. These are things that citizens, um, particularly in the following wards, have more power than average over housing policy. So if you live in the 49th ward, you should be a housing justice voter because your alderman controls what gets heard or not heard in the city council housing committee, drum more. If you live in the 7th ward, same thing, you have more power than the average voter on affordable housing. And if you live in the 25th ward, where Chairman Solis of the zoning committee presides, you have more power than average over affordable housing provision and policy. And we want to talk with you. So come find us because we would really want to talk to you if you live oh. in any of those wards. And can I add quickly about the so so if there's actually a new affordable requirement ordinance specifically for the Logan Square, Avondale, they call it the Milwaukee Corridor. It's a three year pilot where the city, after we fought tooth and nail to get a demolition fee in our community, they said, no, how about this instead? Because um, that's how the city works, unfortunately. They, pro they proposed raising the affordable requirement to 15% in the, along the Milwaukee corridor rather than 10%. They removed the option to pay out of providing affordable units. Oh. Yeah, but it's just, it's just for that Milwaukee corridor. Mm -hmm. It's a three-year pilot that I think will inform future reforms to the ARO. Um, and they have to build 15% affordable on-site or 20% off-site, but within the boundaries of the pilot area. Um, and, you know, it sounded great to us at first. We we're like, oh my God, we won something, progress. But, you know, then we looked at the fine print and realized that all, almost all of the ARO units that have been built have been one bedrooms and yeah. studios. So even if they're creating, a t you know, the mayor's promising a thousand new ARO units in Logan Square and Avondale and that area. Um, but if there, if it's a thousand studios that are affordable, then it doesn't help the families that we that we're trying to serve. So, so if you displace a hundred people and you provide access for fifteen, you're still behind. Yeah. Got it. Right, and if um, it's a hundred families replaced by fifteen singles. Right, right. Yes. Um, and, and I just want to throw something out there as um, uh, to add in. Um, if there's any architects in the room, please design us buildings that are more worthy of us. <laughs> mm, all these new buildings that are going up, these meaningless glass boxes. Um, how we feel on the street when we walk around with our kids in playgrounds is um, says something about you know the environment that we interface with, right? The environment we connect with. Is it is it beautiful? Is it life enforcing? Or is it just ugly and drab? It matters. I think art and architecture matter in the world. Yes, ma'am. Over here. Sure. How are you doing? Uh, my name's Joseph. I'm a community organizer with Chicago Housing Initiative. Um, I wanted to know, um, so like, what, what you guys think, like 15 years from now, uh, what do you see uh, the affordable housing, you know, going to be and how, how can we make that national so we can start you know breaking down barriers to get this thing so because it's, it's been too long mm -hmm. yeah. okay. uh, can, well I think and I, I heard the same question um, before I rephrase that well, what is like worst possible scenario right in those 15 years and I think we are in worst possible scenario you know because right now we have you know pilot programs like um, Christian mentioned that are not generating nearly enough what we need to do to preserve affordable housing or generate even affordable housing for families at all, right? So the the consequences for schools, the consequences for you know many um, many of our programs is very drastic. Uh, I do think like if we are able to push at the grassroots level for this five-year plan. 
for you know more um, more responsiveness from city hall. Uh, I think that we may be able to preserve some of the social fabric of our communities. But in communities like Pilsen, I'd like to be very concrete. Right now, today, we have nothing to preserve um, the affordability of our communities. We see a lot of teardowns, like you know, like um, Christian was saying, the city knows very well what is wrong. They create a pilot program that does nothing or little to address the situation of low-income families. So we need to change, in Pilsen, for instance, the, the situation of, of zoning. Or zoning, unfortunately, is, you know, is RT4. So developers can come at any time, tear down a home, and build a, a six flat or whatever they want to do. And there's nothing that we can do to stop that. Right now. Our proposal is to make sure that we, and I think that the, the like Jackie mentioned, the prerogative of the, of the alderman, unfortunately, it helps the developers. So we need to get money out of politics immediately, like make a conflict of interest. If, the, if they are getting money from the developers and they're giving all the green light to make this happen, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. That's a big problem, you know? And I think that we need to immediately address that in terms of how, and when we start, I mean, there's other, like in the 35th Ward and other communities, they have talked about down zoning. You know these these you know these these issues where we have communities that have no protection. So we can generate the thirty percent or even the twenty one percent that we have right now in Pilsen. But we cannot do anything if we allow developers to pay their way into our communities. That's what I think will make the difference between preserving the social fabric of our communities and the, like Frank was saying, development can generate the resources to help our families. But right now, it serves the interests of a few rich developers. And the mayor's coffer, I mean, the war chest is, that's what he generates $24 million, massively from developers. Those are the main funders, you know, real estate industry and corporate interests. So I think that getting big money out of politics and generate these checks and balances within our city council laws will help us maybe in five years stop what we're seeing, 250,000 black residents leaving the city, and there will be more to come. Immigrant communities and the low-income residents will continue to leave if we don't take immediate action. And we have, like Christian said, 2018 is coming. So that's that's critical, you know, that we send a message and stop these atrocities. Thank you, Byron. And I wish I, we had time for everyone on the panel to respond to that excellent question. Uh, we don't. Um, and I believe that um, Wesley has a final exercise for us. And before we get there, I always want to give Jackie the last <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, one of the things that, uh, you know, happened over the weekend is that uh, Senator John McCain died. And, um, and he was, you know, a hero, uh, no doubt, in spite of what number 45 says about heroes. But um, one of the things that happened during the campaign with, uh, with McCain and Barack Obama was the naming of Sarah Palin as the vice president. And one of the things that she did was to make fun of Barack Obama because he was an organizer. Uh, and so uh, my last word is to say that we all need to be organizers. Um, you know, because we need to, Christian said I think the best when he said, you know, not everybody can come to a forum uh, downtown at nine o'clock in the morning and get information. But all of us who can have the responsibility of organizing so that we can make a change. You know, that war chest, Byron, is, you know, somebody, Ken Griffin gives $5 million or $25 million. That is one vote. Yeah. How many votes are here in this room? And so people power is, in fact, more important than dollar power. But we have to use the power that we have. Um, so my last word, Frank, is that we need to organize and take back our own government. That's right. Thank you, so, um, thank you Byron and Leah and Christian and Jackie. Appreciate your um, spending your time with us today. And let me turn things back over to Wesley. Thank you so. Thank you so much. Uh, can we get another round of applause for our great panel? Any, anything that rose up for anybody, we're gonna spend a few minutes and just kind of raise up any new ideas that may have come to you. Things that maybe weren't on the recommendations of the Chicago Housing Justice League that you're thinking about that are important. There's one right over here in the middle. I'm 
have a broken record for this uh, for anyone who knows me. So one of the things that's not addressed uh, directly in the platform, this like nine points, uh, is the uh, vast majority of people who receive uh, public subsidies for housing in Chicago, uh, it's over 75 percent of those who receive public subsidies for housing in Chicago, 47,000 uh, households uh, is those on the Housing Choice Voucher Program. Um, and uh, it was mentioned about how expensive it is uh, to subsidize a household in, let's say, Lincoln Park. Um, but that's only the beginning of the trouble because there really are families that are even able to move there, much less get subsidized there. Um, so, uh, sorry? How many are in the Well, uh, people on the Housing Trace Voucher Program are out in the street, they're, they just don't have mobility options. Um, so let's say South Shore, for example, uh, and South Shore has more voucher holders living there than 30 of the 42 uh, community areas called mobility areas with lower violent crime um, and lower poverty levels combined. Um, 25 of those 42 mobility areas have fewer than 100 uh, voucher holding families in them. Um, and so yeah, it's 47,000 people are not addressed by the platform. I'd like to see it addressed in some way. One way that it is sort of in a roundabout way addressed is the proactive uh, uh, inspections. Uh, it takes two to three months for a household to from the point time they see an apartment they're interested in, for them to actually, for CHA to process that paperwork, it's prohibitive. Uh, no one in a hot market is waiting three months for you to be able to sign a lease, uh, obviously. Um, so proactive inspections is one way that we can maybe remove that part of, the, uh, that part of the bureaucratic step um, uh, to shorten those times. And uh, there's a county, a small county called King County, uh, where this is done, uh, where um, homes are uh, proactively inspected. And so people just get the cash to go rent and they don't have the stigma attached to them. They might like to see that they know. Thank you very much. Any other ideas or things that really stuck out to you from the forum today you'd like to share with the audience? Others? Well, so I can say one thing that was not in there, uh, and the reason for it is um, one of those principles was avoiding homelessness. We actually solicited, and I'm actually part of the Justice League, we solicited all of our 37 member organizations for a couple of months for suggestions on that and none were forthcoming, which is why that's not in there. It, it, it is, but I mean, we tried for two, Frank's still here, two or three maybe months to get that out and we could not get a single concrete recommendation on it, but so we're still open to, to getting those. Yeah. We had a July 31st deadline to get these out, so. No, no, it's not actually, we, there's actually, uh, is Frank still here? Hi, Hi Michael. Yeah. Uh, talk about the public portal was just opened. Right, so um, there was a very limited way that people on the advisory committee of about 120 people could actually make recommendations to the city through a web portal that would only accept one idea at a time. Um, and that closed down July 31, um, but now the city has just opened the portal to the general public and um, is also planning on having one uh, major public hearing at the Harold Washington Library. I can't remember the date. We will. Um, we'll, Frank or Wesley or me, we can get you that information, actually, if you want that. We'll be sharing information on both the portal as well as information about that public hearing um, an electronic version of our uh, principles and our policy ideas so that you can enter those and other ideas that you may have uh, for that portal. Okay, well, um, if there aren't other big, oh, there's one in the back over here. I actually just had a follow-up question to that. So I think the, the meeting is September 13th, the forum. Um, as someone who's working with healthcare and public health um, constituents, strategically, how much impact do we think that, there, that we collectively can have through those, you know, through the, the idea portal or that public meeting. I know you mentioned earlier that the draft is coming out in early October. Will there be an opportunity to comment after that? Or what, what is the best point at which to try to 
engage our broader network of public health and healthcare colleagues to have an, a meaningful uh, impact in, in this process? Um, the, the short answer is, is that nobody knows. What we're hoping is, is that, um, you know, in the past sometimes the city processes has been talking at folks. Um, we, we hope this time it'll be a little more engaging so far. It hasn't been, but we don't know ultimately. Um, but I would encourage people to participate. Um, I think we're at kind of a critical juncture, and um, the participation itself has meaning because the five-year housing plan, while it's important, it's not the beginning, it's not the end of anything, but it, it certainly keeps a certain amount of momentum going um, in, in democratic order, and that I think is really important. So if only the usual suspects participate, people like me, um, it, it means less than if others participate as well. So I think the participation in and of itself is virtuous. Um, and whether it will have a consequence, we don't know. And we'll see. Hopefully it will. Okay, one more in the front. I was just going to just <laughs> add a point there. The, as she mentioned, the hearing's the 13th. That's Thursday at Harold Washington Library in the evening. And then to your question, after they've submitted the plan, they'll submit it to the Committee on Housing and Real Estate, then they will have a time where we'll go in front of a public hearing about if, if the past plans hold um, suggestive of what forthcoming processes will be, they will uh, have to at some point enter it and then they enable people to have that comment period when that happens probably in October, it's been as late as November. Plus City Hall is going to be involved. Yeah, absolutely. We, we, we have remarked it's the first time we've ever seen where the plan is happening right in front of an election. So I think that does provide both uh, opportunity as well as some level of concern. Thank you. Thank you. One more here in the front. I just want to make a comment that um, with, with the emphasis uh, and some trends going toward housing uh, is health care, um, I wish there had been more this morning on the connection between housing and health care. Um, I've been a founder of a medical respite center on the west side of Chicago uh, in which we take ill and injured homeless men and women from the who have been discharged from the hospital, who have no nowhere left to go to to continue their their healing, um, we do not discharge anyone to the street, and we have people that stay with us much longer than they need to medically because there's no place for them to go for housing. So I just hope that we can keep that and, and, and strengthen that that tie between and uh, connection between housing and healthcare. Thank you. That's essential. Um, yeah, I was just going to actually follow up um, exactly on that point, but just also to say one of the things we discussed, and I think I'd love to hear more of in future things, is where is it socially acceptable or morally acceptable for us to be spending health dollars and public health dollars on housing, and what, where that line is drawn, and how it's drawn in policy now, and where it should be. No, just, just that was the question. Yeah, I don't think so. this will be our last forum on um, on housing. Um, we, you know, we had one on displacement uh, in December of last year, and we had this event uh, today. And you know, this was uh, a sellout crowd, and we had a waiting list of maybe 20, 20 more people. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll definitely be continuing these conversations. So keep those ideas coming. Good for you. Know, yeah. Did you have a comment as well? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. This might sound kind of random because I'm not sure where we are in the program and what we're supposed to be doing right now. So I'm just going to go for it. Um, my name is Lindsay. I work in criminal justice reform and we're doing some re entry housing work right now. I work at a place called BPI, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard of. Um, but I'm also, um, I live in Jefferson Park and I'm involved in my community and a group of us up there called Neighbors for Affordable Housing. It used to be called Neighbors for Affordable Housing in Jefferson Park, but we changed the name. 
we've been fighting for a building at 5150 North, Northwest Highway, which touches on a lot of these issues, so I'm really happy to be here. But just one, one suggestion I wanted to pull out that we've kicked around as an idea that for all I know is in some of these plans, but I haven't read them in depth, is this idea of um, a local workforce preference. So, and, and I'd be interested in hearing if this is something that other jurisdictions around the country have um, talked about or, or implemented. Um, but the idea would be if an affordable housing building goes up, let's say within two or three miles of O'Hare Airport, um, where there are a lot of jobs, the developer says, okay, we're gonna set aside a certain percentage of these units in a local workforce preference for people that work in or right around O'Hare Airport. And that's, I mean, we've thrown this idea out to a specific developer and they were on board. So this is just an idea I want to put out on the table and for all I know it's it's going on in other jurisdictions. Zoning board didn't like it. What? The zoning board didn't like it. Didn't get zoned. Shocking. <laughs> <laughs> Automatic prerogative. <laughs> <laughs> Who's close to five to seven? Well, um, I think we're, we're going to go ahead and close. I want to thank everyone for your participation today. I have a few closing comments. Um, one is that uh, changing policy takes changing power relationships and, and power building and organizing, as Jackie mentioned. Um, and I think we in public health have a lot of learning to do from community organizers and um, from labor organizers about how we build power with communities uh, in order to change policy. Um, we also, uh, many of us who work in public health or healthcare, work for powerful entities that have uh, legislative staff, who have policy staff, government affairs staff, who will work on issues related to uh, reimbursement reform or protecting Medicaid, but are maybe slow t to enter the ring when it comes to things like housing policy. So encouraging our institutions to speak up on issues related to health and healthcare. Um, is another thing that we can do. And if our institutions won't move, we all are, all are constituents in some way, and we have our own voice outside of our jobs. So that's another venue for us to speak up. Um, as I shared, Health and Medicine will be following up and sharing uh, opportunities for us all to weigh in on the five-year housing plan. And again, this is just one venue. There's all, all the time there are new policies being discussed around housing. So please be engaged on an ongoing basis. And again, thank you for joining us today. Have a great day. Thank you.